Well, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, my name is Michael Moynard. I'm a council member of the Australia Institute of International Affairs of Victoria and a fellow of the Australia India Institute. And I welcome you uh, today to the third seminar in our series on South Asia Australia relations on Australia and India's soft power diplomacy. First, I'd like to acknowledge that we are on the lands of the Wurundjeri people who have been custodians of this land for thousands of years and I acknowledge and pay our respects to their elders past, present and future. I'd like to thank our partners in this uh, seminar series, the Australian India Institute, Asia Link Business, Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade, Global Victoria, Australia India Chamber of Commerce, and the Confederation of Indian Industry. We thank them for their support and their involvement in this seminar series. This is the third of the series. Our last of the uh, seminar series will be on Tuesday, 29 June, where we will look at uh, Sri Lanka and Australia relations. This afternoon, if you would like to uh, put questions to our panel, uh, you may do it through the chat box or through the Q&A, and both of those will be monitored uh, by people throughout the session. And so hopefully um, your, your question will be uh, raised and answered by our very esteemed panel. But without further ado, I'd like to um, pass across to our moderator for this evening, Dr. Karen Barker, from the Australia-India Institute. Thanks, Karen. Thank you, Mike. Um, we're delighted to be partnering with the Australian Institute of International Affairs in this event and um, our other great partners. Um, I'd also like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land which I'm broadcasting from. Again, it's the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nations and pay my respect to their elders past, present and emerging. So um, it's great to, to have you all here today. Soft power diplomacy is what we're talking about. And it's such a fascinating area. We're really fortunate to be able to bring you um, some great speakers to talk about this from three different points of view. I'm going to introduce them shortly, but I did want to make, um, first of all, some comments just to introduce our topic. So soft power as a concept has been around for about 30 years was coined by Harvard professor Joseph Nye um, back in 1990 in a book he wrote called Bound to Lead. And he later went on in the mid nineties to become the US Assistant Secretary of Defense for International Security Affairs. He was making a point of distinction from hard power, which is about coercion. That might be through military or um, trade and economic or uh, political um, machination. So that could be trade sanctions, but it could also mean trade deals. So it could work both ways. He defined soft power as the ability to shape the preferences of others through appeal and attraction. And he put culture and values at the very heart of soft power. When Australia wrote uh, its foreign policy white paper in 2017, it also um, used a very similar definition of soft power, which it described as the ability to influence behavior and the thinking of others through the power of attraction and ideas. So this idea of attraction is coming through really strongly. It's about things that appeal to other nations that make them better disposed towards your nation. You could sum it up as a charm offensive, but I think that would be to underestimate the kind of complexity and the power of soft power. And there's obviously an enormous array of possibilities that are covered in the term. We're going to be focusing on arts, sport and education in our discussions today, and our speakers will enlighten us. But uh, you might also think about uh, uh, other areas like um, travel and business and tourism, I'm thinking of India's incredible India tourist campaign. And of course, food. Um, I couldn't help but think when I was reflecting on uh, this afternoon's session about Scott Morrison's tweet from the middle of last year, um, just before the Prime Ministerial Summit on the 4th of June, where he tweeted a, a photograph of himself holding a plate full of 
samosas, which he called scomosas. Um, uh, and he shared that uh, um, with a message to Prime Minister Modi saying what, how, how he wished he could share them in person with Prime Minister Modi. Now, I suspect Prime Minister Modi might have been glad that COVID prevented international travel. Um, but in any case, um, the tweet attracted very quickly thousands and thousands of likes. So 17,000 likes, 4,000 retweets very quickly. And uh, it was dubbed in the Indian, Indian media, uh, Samosa Diplomacy. But it's all soft power in action. The other, the other key uh, thought um, I, I wanted to share with you was about the role of the Indian diaspora uh, in soft power. So in India, there's strong recognition of the power of its global diaspora. They have a ministry for overseas Indians devoted to sustaining connections with the Indian diaspora across the world. But Australia likes to claim the Indian diaspora as one of its uh, national assets as well. Uh, the Varghese report called it Australia's national economic asset. So we also recognise that the influence and attraction um, works both ways through the Indian diaspora. The Varghese report recommends that, uh, or notes that the Indian government puts a lot of effort into working with the diaspora and it strongly recommends that the Australian government does so uh, as well. So I think uh, that's something that we all need to reflect on to see you know, how, how best we can work towards that goal. I think what makes Australia and India's soft power diplomacy efforts so interesting to talk about is that it's not just about promoting social and cultural um, assets and heritage to each other. It's also about how they're used by nations for their foreign policy objectives and their strategic uh, and trade partnerships. And our speakers are going to tell us more about this. They are going to speak for about seven or eight minutes each. And once all three uh, speakers have um, concluded, we will open up for questions um, through our Q&A section of Zoom. That will be around five past six. So let me introduce our lineup. We have uh, speaking first will be Dr. Pippa Dixon. Pippa is the director of AsiaLink Arts at AsiaLink. She has extensive arts leadership experience, both nationally and internationally. She is the director of the National Association for Visual Artists. She is co-chair of the National Craft Initiative. She's the founder of Design Island for Arts Tasmania. And she's also the founding CEO of the Glenorchy Art and Sculpture Park. She has over 15 years experience prior to that as a project manager and consultant in both the private and public sectors. And she's worked uh, extensively outside Australia as well. Her achievements include international advisor to the Cheongju International Craft Biennale in South Korea. And in 2015, uh, a mentorship at the West Kowloon Cultural District Authority in Hong Kong. So it's great to have Pippa on, on uh, our panel this afternoon. I'd also like to welcome Professor Sean Starr. Uh, Sean is the Executive Director of the Centre for India-Australia Studies at OP Jindal Global University in India. He's also very no well known to many of you, no doubt, as the former chair and co-founder of the Australia-India Youth Dialogue. He is uh, Associate Professor and Associate Dean at Jindal Global, uh, Jindal Global Law School. And before that, he worked at, as a lawyer at various top tier law firms in both India and in Australia. He's published a book called Australia and India, a comparative overview of law and legal practice. And his opinion pieces have been featured in Indian and Australian news, newspapers. And uh, he's participated in several panel sessions on Indian primetime TV. Great to have you too, Sean. Thank you for joining us. Uh, our third speaker this evening will be Melina Asana. Melina is a principal solicitor at Swarup Asana Lawyers and Business Advisors. She uh, focuses on commercial law and cross-border work between Australia and India. Previously, she was a principal solicitor with the Victorian Government Solicitor's Office working on major projects for the state of Victoria. Uh, Melina is also on the board of the Law Institute of Victoria. That's the peak body that governs the legal profession in Victoria, and she's the board's first Indian-born member. 
She has a lot of other roles that she plays. She is a uh, um, national vice president of the Asian Australian Lawyers Association. She sits on various other boards, the AFL Southeast Commission Advisory Board, Gymnastics Victoria, Graduate House at the University of Melbourne, uh, Good Shepherd ANZ, and she is the founder of the not-for-profit organisation Multicultural Women in Sport. She's a member of the Football Federation of Victoria Tribunal and was also previously the co-chair of the Women in Business chapter of the Australia India Business Council. A very busy person, Melina. Thanks for joining us. So we have a great lineup for you and I'm going to invite Pippa to start us off by talking to us about the cultural programs run by Asia Link Arts and the role they play in forging ties between Australia and India and perhaps to talk us through some of the issues um, uh, that sort of arise for you when describing these as soft power diplomacy. Thanks so much, Karen, and thank you so much for the invitation to be here. It's a real um, privilege and honour to join you um, from the lands of the Palawa and Pakana people um, in Lutruwita, um, Tasmania, and I acknowledge the traditional owners and custodians of Nipalina, Hobart, the Muanina um, peoples, some of the most resilient peoples um, in the world. And I'd also like to acknowledge and pay my respects to the traditional owners and the land in which the University of Melbourne and Asia Link is situated, the Wurundjeri and Boon people of the Kulin Nations in Nam, otherwise known as Melbourne. Um, I also pay my respects importantly to all First Nations people across the Asia Pacific on whose lands we work, and in particular this evening, the First Nations and Indigenous peoples of India. Um, I am the Director of Asia Link Arts and I've been there um, just over two years now. Um, so Asia Link uh, has 30 year history of engagement throughout the Asia Pacific and a substantive amount of work focused on India um, through that period. Um, we are really at Asia Link Arts a cultural enabler and a facilitator, a conduit um, for Australian artists and creative industries workers um, to engage with the peoples and cultures of the Asia Pacific to drive Australia's creative engagement with the region. And our three pillars for the work that we do are based on building insights, developing connections and enhancing capabilities um, in Australia. So we do that through our work across four program areas, um, Asia Link Business, Asia Link Arts, Diplomacy and the Asia Education Foundation, which focuses on second, primary and secondary um, school education um, teachers and students. Um, in 2019, when I started, um, we had to do a lot of reflection around um, what we were focusing on in the arts program. And our brand work had been established on really um, touring exhibitions from Australia and um, residency and exchange programs. And that was primarily focused on sending Australian artists and creative industries workers throughout um, the region for what we called six or 12 week residencies. Um, and by far India was, by, was one of the most popular um, destinations for Australian artists. And reflecting on that, I think um, we could see that um, from talking to the artists and alumni um, who had been was this sense of community um, that they were experiencing in India. Obviously, there were other factors as well in regard to um, connection of colonialism, um, English being widely spoken in um, artistic cohorts and the like as well. So there were other factors. But as a result, we had a large alumni and some were also diaspora artists in Australia who had reconnected um, with India through those residencies and exchanges. Um, that mode of working was starting to change in Australia we had in some ways achieved our mission in that first 30 years, which was elevating the autonomy and capacity of the Australian arts sector to engage, um, in this case with India. Um, so there was a lot more self-initiated work. Um, people didn't um, as much need that platform for engagement. Although having said that, um, uh, we still get a lot of demand for our work and there's still a lot of work to be done. So we made a strategic shift from that residency and outward bound um, program to much more of an exchange focus. 
and that had been um, work that had been undertaken over the 30 year period, but it wasn't the core focus of Ageling Arts work. And we made a swift transition to that model. Um, thank goodness, because, um, you know, early 2020 and sending uh, 30, 40 Australian artists and arts workers uh, throughout the Asia Pacific would have been quite complicated given the ramifications of COVID-19. So um, in 2019, we started um, a program of reciprocal and two-way exchange. Um, and in that year, we also um, actually um, in late 2019 took a delegation um, across India um, five major cities, five creative industries leaders from the digital technology sector, um, which culminated in um, a conference and speaking engagements at iMyth Festival in Mumbai and actually incredibly successful um, project in that there were some very direct impacts and outcomes for those um, creative industries leaders, including new um, business contracts and engagements with Indian partners. Um, which I think is really exciting because it's an area, digital technology, um, that is really taking off and there's a lot of innovation in India and really seeing um, very interesting partnerships. So not a one-way, one-sided or lopsided engagement, but very collaborative models emerging. Um, but in regard to this um, particular session today, I was excited because I'm talking about soft power and what that means and how it's interpreted in the arts and cultural landscape is something very um, interesting to us. Um, we deliver these insights, capabilities and connections in the arts program through thought leadership, arts-based diplomacy um, and advocacy work. Um, and in the thought leadership and arts-based diplomacy, that's where we base our, our knowledge and expertise of the sector. And we use that to leverage in our advocacy work. Um, we held a conference in early um, 2020. In fact, it was like early March and it was right at the time that borders were starting to close and things were starting to heat up with COVID-19 and we were starting to do elbows and feet. Um, and the conference was called Public Displays of Affection, How Can Artists Rebrand Soft Power? And it was a provocative title deliberately um, to flag the discomfort that many in the creative industries were feeling around this terminology, soft power. And it was the word power that was particularly problematic. Um, and it reflected also on um, the Australian government's um, soft power, uh, the white power paper, excuse me, foreign um, policy white paper and the section on soft power, um, which talks about um, the intention of shaping the external environment. Um, and these um, sorts of languages do press people's buttons in the arts and cultural sector. Um, how could we re recontextualize relations? And I love what you said, Karen, about Joseph Nye and it being values-based. So putting the attention back on the values. So really we said, okay, it wasn't just us, but the sector was saying, we can't project to the world realistically and effectively without knowing who we are, first of all, what are we projecting and for what reason, what is our intention and motivation um, with this? So um, I could talk for ages and ages about this, please wave at me if I've run out of time already. Um, but I think I might leave it there for now, but I think, um, being focused on values, thinking about who we are as a nation and our national identity. Um, what I've called soft power is in fact, image, identity and influence, um, and, but probably starting with identity, first of all, um, and being very careful and considerate of our First Nations identity um, and what that means as well. Thanks so much, Pippa. That's, um, uh, just so much in there and uh, I think you made some really interesting and important points about um, uh, you know the, the way uh, how, how careful we have to be um, so that people don't feel that they're just tools or instruments for um, government manipulation almost I mean that's not quite the right word but um, you know there's got to be um, uh, there's there's got to be uh, some common purpose here um, that's that's uh, good for, for all parts, uh, all parties involved in it. So 
I think, um, again, I, I like your I idea of being um, uh, just treading a little bit delicately and um, con being considerate uh, of the, the sorts of identities that we're working with here. So thank you for that. Um, could I please now um, invite um, Professor Sean Starr to uh, speak to us a little bit about um, uh, the education aspect of soft power diplomacy. Of course, thank you so much, Karen and, and Pippa for those well, the, the thought provoking words to get us kick started. Um, I, I think our introduction, Karen, was fantastic because, you know, some of the words you noted and phrases that, that you yourself paraphrase the, the importance of shaping preferences and perspectives of others. Um, the ability to influence behavior through the attraction of ideas. To me, those resonate almost fundamentally in education. So education has a pivotal role in, in what we're talking about today and, and in soft power and diplomacy. And we see that in terms of most commentators talking about the importance of education in the context of the bilateral relationship or any bilateral relationship really, but particularly the India-Australia bilateral relationship. In fact, Peter Varghese himself in his uh, economic strategy labeled education as one of the, or if not the fundamental pillars of the future of the bilateral relationship. So I think that speaks volumes of the importance of education in bringing countries closer together and in particular, India and Australia closer together. Uh, I think it, education is also fundamental, not just to the bilateral relationship, but also to India's future. If you think about India's demography, it, it, for us sitting here in Australia, it's, it's, it's so foreign to us to, to imagine the numbers of 1.3 billion people, um, some 600 million people under the age of 25, 30. It's, it's unimaginable to us here in Australia. Yet those are the, the age brackets of university age students, primary and secondary age students that we're talking about, hundreds and hundreds of millions of Indians uh, who were aspiring for a world-class education in many cases, uh, who will shape not only the future of India, but the future of the world. So in many respects, it's in Australia, Australia's interest to, to work on building education as a pillar of the Australia-India relationship, because that, as I said, not only shapes the future of our bilateral relationship, but also the future of the Indo-Pacific and the world. Um, I also think the importance of education in, in the context of what we're talking about today is highlighted both in terms of the highs and the lows in the bilateral relationship, let's say over the last couple of decades. If you think back to the student crisis in, in education, for example, and how uh, the, the incidences and scenarios that took place in Australia, uh, how they were broadcasted by mainstream media in India and how to a large extent that shaped the perceptions for a number of years to come. So, so those preferences and perceptions about Australia were shaped through a few incidences in the Australian education system. Uh, and and uh, equally the highs, uh, Pippa talked about these new collaborative models uh, and, and these new opportunities for young leaders in Australia and India are unequivocally shaping the imagination of young Indians about Australia and young Australians about India. So I think the, the future is bright in terms of education as a tool for diplomacy. Uh, and I think the, 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 the nature of education in the bilateral relationship is driven by government and also institutions. So on the one hand, the, the, the government uh, initiatives and um, there's there's a whole host of government initiatives but one of the flagship initiatives is clearly the new Colombo plan which which sees scores of, of young Australians traveling to India year on year of course there's not a whole lot of that happening but I understand there's a lot of digital programs in the meantime whereby young Australians are experiencing India so while these individuals were formerly perhaps ignorant or um, had misconceived perception of what India was, because um, if let's face it, what we read in the media about our Asian neighbors is often not a, a true reflection of, of what's happening on the ground. Uh, 
now young leaders, the next generation of leaders in Australia are starting to understand uh, India a little bit better. And I've seen that firsthand with our programs at, uh, at General Global University where students spend three weeks in India and, and experience a life-changing experience, not, not just their perceptions of India, but their global perspectives. So I think these programs in that instance funded by the government are, are you know, can fundamentally shift perceptions, which is exactly what you were talking about at the beginning, Karen. And, and therefore, it really does highlight how important education is. Of course, you've got uh, institutional collaborations. Um, you know, I've talked about uh, NCP and the various partnerships that, that stem from that. Um, Pippa talked about the, the branches of Asia Link. Asia Education Foundation is one of those, and they do some fantastic work uh, with their bridge program, including with uh, connecting schools in Australia and India. So it's not just higher education when we're talking about that and student mobility. Uh, there's potential to capitalize on education as a tool for diplomacy across all levels of education. Indeed, uh, John has mentioned in the chat, uh, one of our participants here, uh, how about research? Research is a fundamental part of, of higher education, of course, and, and we have government driven and government funded initiatives such as the Australia India Strategic Research Fund, which I mean, fundamentally focuses on science and, and technology and other areas, but they promote collaborations between Australian and Indian researchers and institutions. Equally, the Australia India Council, and I believe we have representatives from the AIC attending today as well, do a fantastic job in diplomacy in terms of connecting institutions and individuals who are doing great work, not only in education institutions, but across a broad spectrum. So I, I, my time's probably up, Karen, but that's just a quick snapshot on what I feel is the importance of uh, education in the context of the diplomacy generally, but the bilateral relationship more specifically. Thanks. Thanks so much, Sean. Um, as somebody who, uh, you know, myself, I'm, I'm deeply involved in the bilateral education relationship between Australia and India. So I, I found that really um, insightful and, um, uh, and interesting as well, especially, um, you know, I, I think one of the things that really struck me about your comments was about the long tails. And this sort of um, picks up um, some of the, 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 the um, art, uh, ex, um, missions and delegations into India as well. You, you know these encounters; they have they have a long, long term influences. Um, and uh, you know, you mentioned the the negative um, experiences from back, dating back to two thousand and eight, um, and you know how how long it took to override those impressions in the Indian mindset. Uh, but similarly, some of these. Uh, more positive experiences, they have lasting positive experiences that we don't need to override, that we just need to boost from time to time. So, um, you know, I think that's a, a really um, interesting point that you made. Um, you made a few other comments too that I'd love to pick up. I hope some people ask you some good questions because I'd love to sort of um, pull out some of the other threads of your comments too. But let's move on um, to hear from Melina. Um, Melina, um, sport, and cricket, for example, you're working with the cliches here. These are the, the things that connect us. Um, you know, we know these so well. So I'm uh, looking forward to hearing your comments about uh, soft power uh, in relation to sports. Thanks, Karen. And thanks, uh, Pippa and um, Sean, for setting the scene. Um, and um, all of you have spoken about the meaning of soft power. Um, so when we talk about that in the sports diplomacy context, what we really mean is using a nation's sporting excellence in ways that enhance the influence and reputation and advance the national interest of the country. Uh, this may be done through international representation in sport or using sport to build linkages with other jurisdictions to maximize trade, tourism and investment opportunities or to strengthen communities. So if we want to focus on, you know, want to build the diaspora focus connections between Australia and India, then I believe sports diplomacy should be right on top of the list. Um, for, and, and as you said, man, uh, Karen, there are sporting relationship for a long time has represented the first C in the three Cs of cricket, commonwealth and curry. And uh, that reflected uh, some somewhat limited efforts in the sports diplomacy 
space as well. Aussie cricketers are extremely popular in, in India and have been able to leverage business and endorsement opportunities based on their popularity. We saw Brett Lee acting in an Indian Australian movie and um, also singing a duet with uh, one of India's leading playback singers. Uh, there were, however, limited examples of diplomacy being used to maximize trade, tourism, and investment opportunities or for strengthening the communities. Um, but this has changed uh, in recently. India's sporting ecosystem has exploded in the last 10 years. Uh, demand for sporting, uh, sports training, sporting goods, fitness and fitness hardware and sponsorship money is growing and have become industries worth billions of dollars. Uh, in real terms, the recreational sports market will keep expanding on the back of positive trends such as uh, focus on healthy lifestyles, a growing middle class with higher disposable income and increased internet penetration. Uh, there's also an increased investment in esports. There are so many media houses just focusing on sport, and there's many startups in the sports technology space. Um, besides the IPL, there's other leagues of sig significance now in India um, at all levels, such as the Pro Kabaddi League, League, Indian Super League, Ultimate Table Tennis, Pro Wrestling League, and Pro Badminton uh, League. Uh, there's also examples of Indian exports growing in these areas. Um, for example, 656, the official brand of the Indian football team, recently announced its merchandise partnership with Portuguese football club Estoril. And most recently, Tata Consultancy Services will be London Marathon's new title partner for the next five years. Very exciting for me as a half marathon runner. The International Chess Federation has recently announced a new partnership with Tech Mahindra for a global chess league, which will be the only world league officially recognized by the governing body of the sport of chess. Uh, India is also slowly positioning itself, themselves as a world-class sporting ecosystem to bring in the biggest sporting events from across the globe. Uh, this is a powerful area of soft yet meaningful projection of India's influence and engagement with the rest of the world. Uh, this changing uh, sports ecosystem presents meaningful commercial engagement opportunities for Australia. Um, and there are examples, quite a few examples of this. For Australian um, universities already have tie-ups in India. The latest is the MBA degree for cricket to be launched by the Univers University of New South Wales. This course will include the learnings from BCCI and IPL. Um, Australian companies like Empower Sport and Catapult Sport Technologies are already in the India market and Indian sports tech companies like Stance Beam and Sports Watt have already existing partnerships with Cricket Australia and Premier Cricket Leagues. Infosys is the technology partner for Australian Open. The Prarambika Sports Academy is being set up in Bihar by an Australian alumni and seeks to um, use Australian expertise for its programs. The Sports Analytics World Series, which is an Australian initiative, is also hosted in India. And last time I spoke at that in 2018, it was linked to the sports trade mission from Victoria. So though there are significant commercial opportun opportunities for Australia to achieve its sports diplomacy goals, India's engagement in this space is largely Eurocentric, um, with little business being generated between Australia and India. Uh, further, it is likely that the pandemic may have halted India's plans for achieving sporting excellence, and post-pandemic, India's sporting structure and requirements may change. Uh, for these reasons, as well as from uh, my own experience and what's in the strategy, India's strategy as well, at this point of time, the obvious means of engagement in sport may not necessarily be commercial. Uh, the strategy, in fact, uh, the Varghese report, in fact, suggests that these opportunities are largely in areas of government dialogue and policy support or developmental and community relationship building. Uh, such engage engagement is, however, valuable from the sports diplomacy perspective. And in the long run, uh, the benefits tend to also spill into other areas of trade significance, such as education and skills training, science and innovation, health, tourism and infrastructure. Um, for example, the Boxing Day tests with India, as well as the World Cup, were pretty reliant on Indian tourism for its success. And when you link that with trade missions, it can have a twofold impact. Our diaspora is really strong and still very connected to India. Engaging with diaspora here, as well as a long-term commitment towards issues that are critical for India's growth and welfare, are important elements of sports diplomacy between the two countries. Uh, sports engagement can also be a vehicle for advocacy on important issues like gender equality, women's empowerment, and disability inclusion, some of the issues that are really close to my heart. Um, there's also an increased focus on corporate social responsibility in the area of sport. Um, in India, for example, Tata Steel and Reliance Industries have several academies, sports complexes, and sports feeder centers with investment worth billions. A partnership with these corporates that have a significant share of the Indian market on the CSR initiatives in the sports uh, sector is likely to enhance the visibility of Australian sporting businesses, as well as their charitable initiatives in India. Um, 
And there's some engagement by Australia and these community strengthening initiatives in India already, um, but they're re rarely government supported and are sporadic without long-term commitment. For example, our sports people are well represented there and are not only playing, coaching or commentating for various leagues, including IPL and Super League, but are also involved in charity work or pushing developmental agendas. Recently, endurance runner Samantha Gash, who's also a good friend of mine, raised close to 300,000 for Oxfam for COVID relief in India by organizing a virtual run. Uh, Cricket Australia also donated uh, $50,000. This promotes a positive image um, of Australia. Uh, Richmond Football Club, along with Australian um, sporting um, uh, a company called Primitive Sport um, has undertaken performance testing for young athletes using um, uh, high performance, um, using technology um, in schools in India. Um, Melbourne City Football Club has played two matches in India and are working on some projects for increasing participation in sport. They've had a Diwali game a couple of years ago in Melbourne, uh, which I helped organize. And there's also projects with underprivileged children, people with disabilities and disadvantages in women that have been undertaken by sporting organizations, Australian sport, sporting organizations like Reckling, AFL, hockey, cricket, the Deaf World Cup. I helped out in the AFL for as well, the Reckling tournaments in India, which had local kids from underprivileged backgrounds participating. It was amazing. And and AFL and AFL clubs also have local initiatives in Australia to engage with the diaspora. I also just very briefly want to mention my work in sport in Australia through my not-for-profit Multicultural Women in Sport, which aims to create pathways for increased participation of women from multicultural backgrounds in sport for their empowerment, well-being, and a sense of belonging to the community. My recent appointment uh, on the advisory of the Prarambika Sports Academy and also the Sports Law and Entertainment Center at the Gujarat National Law University will hopefully allow me to share some of my learnings in Australia for the benefit of increased female participation in India. Uh, some other areas of uh, collaboration to consider maybe, so for example, in India, maybe leadership programs for Indian women through sport, sharing sports integrity and governance knowledge, uh, which ultimately increases the quality of sport, programs that increase participation, especially of women and in community sport, awareness and education programs to promote value of sport for well-being and also creating uh, career pathways through sport. Um, in Australia, it is important to engage more meaningfully with the diaspora, including having diaspora play at elite levels to provide role models, and also to reduce racism in sport, which has a negative impact on Australia being regarded as a welcoming nation. Um, also, since Australia has managed the outbreaks well during the pandemic, there is a significant opportunity for Australia to offer to host sporting events, including for India. So for me, the empowerment route resonates the most for Australia's engagement strategy with India and sports. It aligns with our values and capabilities in the sports ecosystem. It may be the more likely way forward in the short run and would assist us in making a meaningful contribution that goes to the heart of a much broader and deeper relationship with India built on people-to-people -people links. The humanitarian aspects of sports diplomacy become even more relevant to support India's recovery from a de devastating second wave and sporting endeavors may indeed provide that vehicle for many to recuperate, build social connections and perhaps even find employment. So that's it for me, open to questions. Thanks so much, Melina. Um, uh, just a, an amazing sweep of uh, information there. And um, you certainly broadened the idea of just the, the cricket connection to something, you know, so much more than that. And uh, all the sort of the interconnected um, commercial aspects, but also um, that idea of empowerment. And the thing that really resonated for me, I think was the, um, your reference to the people to people connections, because. In short, this is what soft power is all about. It's about those people-to-people -people connections. Um, and um, I, I think that came through really, really strongly with your comments about um, gender equality and um, multicultural engagement in, in sport. Um, so thank you so much for that. Well, um, that's our three presentations. And um, the questions are already coming through um, uh, on Zoom. So thank you very much for sending that. Um, we're opening up for uh, questions, so please, please um, upload your, your question through the, the Q&A or chat. And I'm just gonna go and, pardon me, while I uh, go back and read some of these out. So, um, Pippa, this might be one for you. Um, there is a, a, a comment here about um, how MasterChef is a popular TV show in India. Um, how can Australia build and promote other forms of contemporary Australian art and First Nations art in India. 
Uh, that might be a comment and then a question that's completely separate. <laughs> yeah, I think um, it's a good it's a good comment and um, an astute one too because as you mentioned earlier, you know the food food <laughs> is something that we all identify with, of course, and um, it is such an enormous contributor to our um, love for um, Indian culture um, when we think about it a little bit more. I think that's what is required actually. Um, I think the Australian government has been very good at understanding um, the value of the First Nations um, um, culture and identity and what that means in the countries of the Asia Pacific or Indo Pacific. And there have been some really good examples of um, touring exhibitions and performances um, and collaborative projects, projects that are a little bit more bespoke and nuanced um, happening with partners in India. And I think some of the most interesting ones actually are diaspora led, so Indian Australian diaspora led um, projects. Um, so led by people who really fundamentally understand um, people, place and culture. Um, so that sort of thing is happening, but I think there's a lot more that needs to happen. Um, there, are, there are some uh, disconnects at the moment, um, for example, between um, um, the level of galleries to be able to accept, um, you know, triple A rated art, if you like, in terms of touring exhibitions in India. Um, obviously, vastly different climates um, and, and the like makes it quite problematic in some instances, but that's not to say it doesn't happen. Um, I think there's just so much more to, to do there. We, as I mentioned very briefly um, in the beginning, um, someone's also asked a question around technology, science and technology, and we shouldn't forget that um, arts, culture and the creative industries are such an expansive sector that it crosses over into all of these areas, of course, as well. So there are many artists using um, science and technology, technology um, as a form of communication and um, modality in their work. Um, and that's what we were focusing on in our delegation. And as I said, has led to actual work outcomes and future collaborations for some of those delegates. Mm. And actually um, new podcast series that's going to be um, launched very soon through the Consulate General in Mumbai, which is a series of conversations between um, Australian creative industries workers and Indians. So um, there was a curated process from the Indian side of matching um, creatives and, and, and developing a new conversation and one of those was um, an Australian First Nations technologist, Michaela Jade, who works in VR and augmented reality in the education sector, um, teaching kids about um, digital identities through cultural identity. Um, it's a fascinating project. And she actually collaborates with technology partners in India um, at Microsoft based there. Um, in Hyderabad and you know so those these sorts of things are just tentacles you know the relationships lovely connections people yeah. to people the networks are quite quite surprising yeah. and I add to that it's not my area of expertise but there is a lot of um, there's a university in um, Odisha the Kalinga Institute of Social Sciences and that's basically a university that was a school that houses uh, feeds uh, and, um, you know, trains and educates 20, 20 to 25,000 Indigenous kids that live there. And it's a fantastic opportunity for Australia to collaborate because they're learning from Indigenous knowledge themselves there. If we could have these kind of collaborations and more people-to-people -people collaborations as well, I think that would help in enhancing those ties through Indigenous, um, you know, exchanges of inf uh, Indigenous knowledge, which we all kind of, we, we're not aware of it, but there's it's so much there. It would be fantastic. I think that's a great, a uh, really good point. And uh, I mean, we often invoke um, Indigenous culture when we engage internationally. And uh, it would be great to um, to, to link um, uh, Australia and India's Indigenous peoples together in in you know various kinds of ways. So that would be great. Um, I'm just going to move on to another question now. And this one might be for you, Sean. It relates to um, India's studies. So. Um, the question is about what role the diaspora can play in lobbying for increased India studies, including language studies in Australian schools and universities. So there's only a handful of um, places that 
in Australia that offer um, uh, Indian studies, uh, La Trobe University and ANU. Uh, and Hindi language is uh, very underdone as well um, at the university level, but even at school level. And I'm wondering whether, from your point of view, as somebody who's based in India, um, uh, you know, whether you th see this as a, an issue for, you know, continuing engagement? Absolutely. Uh, I, I think the question presupposes that we need more um, sort of South Asian languages being taught and South, South Asian studies. And I'd agree with that assumption. Um, and in fact, I think, unfortunately, the trend is going the wrong way in some respects in terms of uh, education, not only uh, with respect to uh, Indian languages, South Asian languages, but also South Asian culture. And equally, uh, Australia studies as a focus in India, because what are we talking about here? We're, we're talking about shaping the Australian imagination in India and vice versa, uh, shaping how and what Australians think about India and India's history and India's culture. So without education, we're not doing that. And, you know, while, while it's um, difficult to kind of contrast because it's apples and oranges, the, the China-Australia relationship and India-Australia relationship, if I think of the, you know, number of Australia studies centres in China or chairs of Australia studies versus India, you know, frankly, I'm not sure that there are many active Australia studies programs at all in any shape in India, as opposed to China. And, and equally, um, China studies centres, for example, or whatever you'd like to call them in Australia. So there's there's clearly um, been, been a lot more work done both on the language and culture and history side for other Asian countries, particularly China. And I, I think there, there needs to be a strong push by institutions, so universities, schools, but also governments. And also, as the attendee mentions, the diaspora absolutely can play a very active role in lobbying. But it's not just about the diaspora. Um, we need you know, non-individuals, people from Australia without necessarily people who have had a connect you know, generationally to India to, to, to want to learn. And in fact, to have the opportunity to learn about India in the school system and higher education system. And with the, I guess, you know, there's, there's a lot of debate about funding for certain programs in institutions, but with the, uh, the fewer programs we have and the fewer opportunities we have, we're really um, not creating access opportunities for people who want to learn about South Asia and want to learn about India and want to learn Indian languages. So I absolutely agree with the attendee who, who made that comment. There are a few fantastic programs. Um, it, La Trobe and ANU have been mentioned, but unfortunately there are only a few. And equally, there are fewer in an Indian context programs about Australia. So again, people rely on what they read in, in the mass media. Uh, whereas when we're talking about self power, when we're talking about shaping perspectives and, and perceptions. We, we really need leading Australian academics and education, educators to have more of a presence in India to highlight how strong our institutions, how strong our thought leadership is in Australia and vice versa. So I, I think there's a, a big gap there that, that ought to be filled um, you know, sooner rather than later. Thanks, Sean. That's a, a great response and I can only wholeheartedly cheer cheer that on. Um, we, we had a really interesting question come through the chat uh, on something uh, quite different, um, asking about um, the, uh, the relevance of the Quad uh, for connecting Australia and India. And I don't know if uh, any of our panellists would like to, to comment on this. Um, from my perspective, that's more uh, to do with the hard power rather than the soft power side of things. Um, so it provides some uh, some context, um, but I think our our focus is um, more on what's happening um, outside of those um, uh, sort of more formal government to government relations. Um, feel free if anybody would like to add anything to that. Otherwise, I consider that one. I'll just um, I maybe just add um, something to that um, that. Sometimes the most successful projects are multilateral, 
they're not just bilateral, um, having other perspectives and um, opportunities to engage in a conversation can be really useful. Um, one of the projects that our Indian partners invited us to collaborate on was a project that was also being supported um, through the British Council as well. So having Indian, um, British and Australian artists and creatives together in the same place in India was, you know, very interesting and brought a, a global um, perspective um, that we might not have had as just a bilateral conversation. So all I would say is that I think it's very useful and very powerful sometimes to have that multilateral voice. Yeah. And, and I and, um, would um, echo that, Pippa, I mean, some of the more successful pro projects and, and um, collaborations we've had it, and more powerful collaborations have been these multilateral types. So not necessarily the, the four nations in the quad, but for example, we've in collaboration with Monash and an institution in Indonesia held a social entrepreneurship partnership where, you know, we've got, again, scores of students from three different countries working together, solving the world's problems. And it's quite amazing when you, you put young leaders from different cultures and different countries together in a room, it's, it's sort of even more powerful than the, than the bilateral sort of institution to institution ties you get from just two countries. And, and I'll just add that yeah, I completely agree with um, uh, Pippa and, and Sean. And I think um, it's um, also with the trilateral relationship between Japan, Australia, and India, that's an interesting one. Then there's the RCEP. There's so many different bilateral uh, relationships that are forming. And I think post COVID, the geopolitical dynamics would have cha would change as well. And that would impact on the soft, and it's definitely hard power, but it would impact on the soft power um, stuff as well, the soft diplomacy that we're talking about. So for example, if Australia's focus um, has changed from China, then perhaps even for whether it's education or it's sport or art in Australia, we start, start focusing on, on that um, in the future. So uh, that definitely the hard power has an impact on soft power and vice versa, we call, kind of all has, has to work and work together. Mm -hmm. Um, thanks, um, Pippa, Melina, and Sean, that, that's a great response. And I really want to um, say thank you to our um, participants who sent through that question because that, that really provoked a really great response from all three of you. So thank you. Um, we might have time for one, possibly two more questions if they're reasonably quick. We've got about um, uh, two or three minutes left for questions. And um, we've got a question here about um, the... Um, the movie business and um, Indian movie producers who are um, um, they, they're coming to Australia to, to do their, their films and spending vast money to do so. Is there, is there any um, talk that um, you perhaps Pippa might be able to answer this? Um, is there any suggestion that the Australian government is interested in establishing some kind of office that might facilitate these sorts of projects. And as, as this questions come through, I'm also thinking um, uh, back to the idea of uh, um, uh, something like the Goethe Institute or Alliance Francaise. Um, India's got its um, ICCCR. Um, that is an um, organisation that promotes Indian culture um, globally. So um, would, would you care to yeah. comment? Yeah, sure. Well, I mean, first of all, great question. The film industry, what um, uh, I mean, what capacity um, to change minds, hearts, spirits, um, connect people through story. And I really think, um, you know, credit to Sean for talking about the power of education to connect, but the power of storytelling um, and sometimes just the most basic human connections are just completely transformational. So I just think huge area, um, massive economic driver, um, globally. Um, there is Ausfilm um, in Australia, which I think is administered through the Office for the Arts. Um, and they, there are incentives provided, I believe, in Australia for filmmakers, um, foreign filmmakers. And we only have to see what's occurred during COVID. We haven't really talked about impact of COVID in developing a relationship with India and you know, many other countries, but Australia was sought, um, looked to. Um, from industry players, particularly, you know, the Hollywood um, segment of the market. Um, and we know that that's had a huge ramification, very positive in many instances, and also some negative apparently as well. 
um, but it's been a huge generator of employment um, for people in Australia. And, um, you know, can we retain this industry? Can we retain this um, post-COVID? I think that's a big question. Um, so, yeah, I wholeheartedly applaud this question. Can Australia do more to encourage the huge industry that um, India has um, in the film sectors um, to Australia and have it as a long-term opportunity here? I think that's incredibly exciting. And, um, yeah, but I do believe that there are support mechanisms in place. There probably need to be a lot more, to be honest. That's great. Thanks. Thanks very much, Pippa. Um, I wanted to mention something there if that's uh, appropriate, mm -hmm. if you have time. Um, there is um, uh, there's a lot of grants being offered by whether it's the Victorian government, New South Wales government or the federal government for um, shooting in, in Australia. And right now there is a lot of activity in that space with a lot of international projects happening. And I think it would be interesting. It would be really good if there was more Indian projects coming here as well. In fact, I am working uh, at the moment with an Indian um, uh, actor who's now a producer who's wanting to make a movie here in Australia about Bali 9 and he's looking for funding as well and we're trying to find some funding for him and um, it's all about you know using local uh, talent and local resources and being able to create jobs here so I think it would be it would be interesting to have a body that actually looks at just this uh, currently there isn't but I think there's a lot of scope for this we, and especially now post COVID because we've got a safe environment here, uh, which a lot of other countries can't offer at this point of time. It would be a good uh, business um, opportunity as well for Australia. Um, great comments. Thanks, Molina. And um, I think we've uh, just run out of time for our Q&A. So I'd just like to thank all the people who um, joined us for today's session uh, and for sending through such uh, great questions. And we were going to um, ask the panel what they thought uh, about soft diplomacy in the future in a post-pandemic or during pandemic world. Um, but I think we've heard probably enough um, about um, uh, virtual delegations and uh, virtual uh, exchange experiences. I don't know if it quite works the same for sport, but there's always um, <clears throat> alternatives. We've got um, e-gaming and, and um, uh, technology being used in all sorts of other ways. So I, I think um, we can say we, we covered it during the course of our conversations. So it just remains for me to um, thank our panellists for such a engrossing conversation. And now I wish we had a lot more time to, to keep talking. Um, some really, really um, fantastic points. And uh, this um, session has been recorded, so we should be able to um, share the, the session with you on the websites at um, AIIA in um, the future and possibly at AII also. Um, I'd like to thank our speakers, Dr. Pippa Dixon from uh, Director of Asian Arts at AsiaLink. Professor Sean Starr, Executive Director of the Centre for India-Australia Studies at Opie Jindal Global University, and Molina Astana, the Principal Solicitor at Swarup Astana Lawyers and Business Advisors. I'd also like to thank our um, partners in this, the Australian Institute of International Affairs, Australia India Institute and AsiaLink Business. And uh, just before we go, I just would like to remind you to register for the final event in this series. If you enjoyed this discussion, you'll love the next one. It's on Sri Lanka's geopolitics and trade potential. And it's on the 29th of June. This one's going to be in person, fingers crossed, uh, in at Dyson House in East Melbourne. Um, so I hope, um, and I, but I believe it will maybe a fusion version. So if you can't make it in person, there might be a way to zoom in. So I hope to see everybody um, uh, again on the 29th of June for the Sri Lanka's Geopolitics and Trade Potential. So thanks again for everyone for joining us and um, look forward to seeing you next time. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you.